of the Miami Dolphins established themselves as one of, if not the biggest Super Bowl favorites in the NFL. We talk about that and so much more coming up next year on this episode of Locked On NFL. You are Locked On NFL. Your daily NFL podcast. Part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Welcome into another episode of Locked On NFL, where your daily NFL podcast. I'm your host, Kevin Ostreicher. I'm the host over at Locked On Ravens. We are free and available all podcasting platforms. That includes over in video form on YouTube, and you can follow us anywhere you get your podcasts. And today's episode of Locked On NFL is brought to you by LinkedIn. LinkedIn Jobs is to find the qualified candidates you want to talk to fast about your job for free. LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown NFL. LinkedIn.com slash Lockdown NFL. Approach your job for free. Terms and conditions apply. We're back another week here. Week three, Sunday's action in the books. We're bringing you the biggest stories from across the NFL. And I don't think we can start off the show without talking about the Miami Dolphins. 70, 70 points against the Denver Broncos. Locked with Kyle Krabs in the first segment about the Dolphins, their Super Bowl aspirations, and their hopes. Then in the second part of the show, the Indianapolis Colts get a huge one over the Baltimore Ravens. In week three, we'll talk with Zach Hicks of Locked On Colts about maybe if they could steal the AFC South. They currently have sole possession of first place in the AFC South. We'll talk about that. Then then we'll round out the show with Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings. The Vikings 0-3 after winning the NFC North last year. We'll talk about what's going on with them, what their playoff hopes should be. So let's first get into our conversation with Kyle Krabs of Locked On Dolphins. Well, we've talked about if Tua Tagovailoa was arrived, but I think the Miami Dolphins might have fully, fully arrived with their unbelievable, unreal 70 to 20 win over the Denver Broncos in week three. It was an unreal performance from just everyone on the Dolphins. The Broncos right now not feeling too good. Here to talk about that with me is Kyle Krabs the host of Locked On Dolphins. And Kyle, I know when you talk about takeaways, there's only so much you can take away from certain games. With this one, how do you kind of put into words what the Dolphins just did? Because we've barely seen anything like this over the course of history. Yeah, it's. Um, I, I try to go back to the thought process of the highs are never as high as they feel and the lows are never as low as they feel. But like, this is a big time win, right? Like this team started 3-0 last year, but it didn't really feel the same way that 3-0 feels this year. Right. And, and I think Miami's kind of at a, a juncture where they come home from two games on the road and they make a really powerful statement. They run for 350 yards against Denver. Like that was something last year that was not a part of the equation. And it they had success running the ball against New England down the stretch in last week's game. And then they come out and they average eight yards per carry. And Devon A. Chain rushes for more yards in this game than any Miami Dolphins player for their season cumulative total in 2019. Like no running back had more yards in a season than Devon A. Chain just had in this game against Denver. So you heard about the leap in the running game and the reinvestment in there and Mike McDaniel, and you've heard the trade rumors for running backs. Well, Raheem Mostert goes for four touchdowns. Devon A. Chain rips off 200 rushing yards. So I think that it, it definitely feels a little different because it is a very different picture that's being painted with how this team can beat you. Yeah, one of my one of my favorite stats from this game, Kyle, is 8.1 yards per carry as a team for the Dolphins. And it wasn't like, oh, five carries, right? It was 43 carries, right? eight yards per carry on, like, just unbelievable there. But another thing about this is they didn't have Jalen Waddle in this game yeah. with a concussion. And you're thinking, well, all right, that kind of lowers the offensive firepower a little bit without the duo of Hill and Waddle out there. But then they go up and, and they put 70 points on the board here. I mean, I know it's not going to be this every single week, but how good is this Miami offense right now? I, I think the the fact of that, and it's the first time in a long time that this has been the case, there's the same offensive infrastructure and coaching and system and scheme for not just Tua Tagovailoa quarterback, but for like the the Dolphins and offense in general, Brian Flores had four offensive coordinators in three years here, so it's kind of been a thing. So uh, an offense that is predicated around timing and spacing and speed and spot throws and chemistry as far as timing goes with your drops and your footwork. They talk a lot about marrying the footwork to the concepts and throwing the space and 
the ball positioning and the angles of the receiver setting up run after catch. Like you see all these things add starting to add up and it, it really does put them in a position where you have to be able to play physical on the perimeter and win at a numbers disadvantage in the box against the run. And until you're able to do that, you know, you go into a game against Miami saying we're going to have to score points to win the football game. That's just, that's just how they're playing right now. And it's, this is the second most points a team in NFL history has had in their first three games. It was two two points below the 1968 Dallas Cowboys with 130 points scored through three games. So just outstanding offensive performance thus far. Mike McDaniel made good use of his offseason. Yeah, well, 100%. And I know all the talks about the offense, but defensively they – Hold the Broncos to 20 points, which obviously compared to 70 is not quite enough to uh, go out there and win the game. What is even the defense in this one, though? Yeah, I I really liked how they got after the football. They had three turnovers. They won the turnover differential in this football game. And uh, Javon Holland, two punch outs on Cortland Sutton, really hunting the ball after the catch. That was something that Bradley Chubb had in week two against the New England Patriots and uh, Pop Douglas. So they've had great effort after conceding catches to attack the football. Now they, they were pretty persistent with pressure uh, against Russell Wilson. They only got home once. I think some of that's due to the speed of Jerry Judy and Marvin Mims. They play pretty soft, like on the ceiling of the defense. And you saw Russ try to take a couple shots and the safeties almost had interceptions on both of those plays. So there was space underneath quick timing throws, but just the way the game script went, that was never going to be a sustainable way to keep, keep pace in the game. And I think Denver, self-inflicted wounds in their own right. Miami doing the takeaways the, the way that they did. Um, 13 points allowed, conce- conceded defensively. They had a, a kickoff return as well uh, for seven points there in the second half. So uh, I love the way that they really buckled down, but they stayed true to kind of the, the thought process throughout the entire game. And they dared them to stay patient. And as that game got further and further away, Denver just couldn't afford to do it. Now, you mentioned that this this 3-0 and feels different than last year's 3-0. and how do they kind of keep up what they're doing now, keep the consistency and keep winning as opposed to what happened last season, which obviously involved a late season collapse? Yeah, uh, I certainly think health is a part of that conversation, but that's not to say the Dolphins haven't had their fair share of adversity in the first month of the season in that regard anyway. Jalen Waddell in concussion protocol didn't play in this game. Tron Armstead made his season debut in this game. He missed the first two weeks. Uh, Jalen Ramsey is coming back sometime mid season. So They've kind of had to shuffle the deck a little bit, and I think that's kind of the the thought process and the way the Dolphins constructed their roster was we are going to go after enough impact players so that as we deal with weekly attrition and guys miss time because of bumps or bruises or minor injuries, we still have enough impact players to be able to take that in stride and allow us to win football games. And I think you're seeing, especially now that the running game is a little bit more complete, there's less stress on the passing game, less stress on protection. It really has opened everything up where I think they have enough needle mover players between the young players that have gotten better and the the transactions that they've made that if you don't have Jalen Waddle, or if you don't have Jalen Phillips and Teron Armstead, who didn't play in week two against the Patriots, your roster's position where you can overcome that. And the the big thing for Miami is just going to not be seeing that needle tip too far where too many of those needle moving players are out simultaneously. In all offseason, Kyle, I think everyone was hyping up the AFC as, as such a strong conference, and there are going to be all these playoff Super Bowl contenders in it. And, you know, the Dolphins, to me at least, I, I always thought they were an underrated Super Bowl playoff contender. But it's been more of a slow start than many thought for the conference. But the Dolphins have come out throwing punches and scoring 70 points. Where do you kind of view them right now among the NFL's elite? Do you think they're Super Bowl contenders and and prime ones right now, or do you think they still have to show a little more consistently over the course of the next couple of months or so? I, I think they absolutely deserve to be in the first tier of the conversation. And I think the big test for Miami is you go to Orchard Park next week and you play the Bills. And Buffalo's coming off a really impressive victory of their own against Washington. The Bills are a team that has had a lot of success against you head to head. Now, the three games last year were all decided by three points or less. You go up to Orchard Park, you move to 4-0, and you beat Buffalo in their building. I think that's where you can really look at the body of work for the Dolphins and say, hey, you know, we, we've checked the boxes. We got a couple softer NFC games on the schedule coming up at home the next two weeks. You could be looking at the Dolphins potentially. If they beat Buffalo, they get the Giants and Panthers at home the next week, the next two weeks after that. Like you could be looking up at the midway point, and this team's very much going to be in that conversation for the number one seed but that starts with what they do next Sunday against Buffalo. 
Kyle bringing the Dolphins insight. And I don't know if he's ever going to witness the Dolphins score 70 points again, but uh, he's enjoying it 100% right now. And for more on Kyle's work, check it out over at the Locked On Dolphins podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network. Your team every day. Coming up in the second part of the show, we'll switch over to the AFC South and talk with Zach Cakes about the Colts' big win over the Ravens. So be sure to stay tuned, play to talk about on Locked On NFL. But first, this episode is brought to you by LinkedIn. And these days, every bit to hire can feel like a high stage wager for your small business. You always want to be 100% certain you have access to the best qualified candidates available. That's why you have to check out LinkedIn jobs, LinkedIn jobs, help to find the right people for your team faster and for free. And for me, I've had a ton of success on LinkedIn, finding jobs for myself or finding jobs for my friends, sending jobs to people. It's really great. And LinkedIn, it's really easy to create a free job post over there on LinkedIn jobs. All you have to do is add your job in the profile hashtag hiring frame through your LinkedIn profile and spread the word that you're hiring. They have simple tools you can use, like screening questions, making it easy to focus on candidates with just the right skills and experiences. So you can prioritize who would like to interview and who you would like to hire. And it's also really important to both start and end the year strong and the right team member might help you do that. That's why small businesses are in jobs. Number one is delivering quality hires or something competitors. Then in jobs to find the qualified candidates you want to talk to faster about your job for free. LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NFL. LinkedIn.com slash lockdown NFL to push your job for free. Terms and admissions apply. We're back for our second segment, Locked on NFL Monday edition. Kevin Ostriker is still here with you talking NFL football. We just talked with Kyle Krabs with Locked on Dolphins about that 70 point unbelievable performance. But let's move over to the Indianapolis Colts. Go into Baltimore as underdogs, and they pulled out with Gardner Minshew as the quarterback as Anthony Richardson was out of this one with a concussion. We'll talk with Zach Hicks of Locked On Colts now about if the Colts can maybe steal the AFC South and how they pulled out this one against the Ravens. What a game for both the Baltimore Ravens and Indianapolis Colts. It was a, a wet game, a sloppy game, but the Colts come out on top is eight point underdogs at MT Bank Stadium 22 to 19 in overtime. Here to talk about how the Colts pulled this off and if there's maybe some division winning DNA in this team. It's Zach Hicks, one of the hosts over at Locked On <laughs> Colts, riding high, obviously, after incredible kicking performances, a front seven performance by the Colts that got the job done. Zach, how, how the Colts do this? How, how'd they stifle the Ravens and pick up this win? They won ugly. They won ugly. You know, that's just. That's the that's what you need to do going on the road with your backup quarterback against a really good Baltimore Ravens team is embrace the, the underdog role, come out and be the villains early and just win ugly, make less mistake, make fewer mistakes, just get after it, play some hard nosed football. And uh, they, they did it. I mean, look, look, they got bailed out by the Ravens being their own worst enemy multiple times in this game, fumbling when Lamar Jackson was doing the tuck rule thing uh, early in the game and having a couple other uh, miscues there on the Ravens side of the field. But look, in, in this league, you need to take advantage of games like this and, and take advantage of games where it is an ugly, very, very ugly game. Uh, you need to take advantage of those ones and the Colts are able to come out here, eight point underdogs on the road with their backup quarterback and beat one of the AFC's best teams in the Baltimore Ravens. So, you know, that's not something we can just you know, shrug off, you know, the Colts, they came to play. They're a feisty team and they got after it today. Yeah. I mean, they did 100%. And I know there was a lot of conversation. We talked about it, Zach, on our crossover about the Richardson versus Minshew debate. And, you know, who gave the Colts the better <laughs> shot to go out there? Now Richardson has looked great through two weeks so far. I think he looked a lot better than a lot of people thought he would, but Minshew was the veteran. He's been in situations like this before. And while it wasn't necessarily a, perfect, pretty performance by Gardner Minshew. I mean, look, he, he did enough to get the job done. How do you think Gardner kind of piloted this offense? Gardner Minshew is a top tier backup in this league. And he played like it. He played like a really good backup quarterback in, in, in this game. You know, he made a lot of mistakes. He was not able to pick up some of those blitzes from Kyle Hamilton. He ran out the back of his own end zone towards the end of regulation. He had a almost very costly fumble towards the end of the game, and they really weren't able to push the ball down the field much because Gardner just doesn't have that kind of arm. But at the end of the day, he did what a good backup quarterback does. He came in the game, and he didn't force the issue. He didn't make a ton of mix mistakes. He did enough for the Colts' defense and special teams and playmakers around him to get the win. You know, he turned around and gave the ball to Zach Moss without fumbling it. That's a win. He got the ball out of his hand on third and short to Josh Downs, Michael Pittman Jr., and Alec Pierce a couple times and kept the Colts offense moving to get in field goal range for Matt Gay. Uh, yes, he got bailed out by the Colts defense playing just some outstanding football in this one, but 
that's what a good backup quarterback does. They're game managers. They're guys who can steal games for you because they're not going to play big time mistake football. They're going to keep the ball moving. They're going to keep possession going for your offense uh, and they're going to give you chances to win. So I look, look, I, I don't know if there's much of a debate between Gardner Minshew and Anthony Richardson. It's Anthony Richardson's team. Gardner Minshew even knows that, but Gardner Minshew did what a really good backup quarterback does. And as he came into this game, you know, on the road, eight point underdogs, didn't make the big mistake. And he let the Colts just be that feisty team and win ugly. I mean, that's that's what you want out of your backup. So I'm not going to crown Gardner Minshew for what he did in this one. It wasn't a fantastic game, but he did just enough for the Colts to get this win. And that's, you know, we can praise him for that because that's what a good backup quarterback does. Yeah, it's, it's what he needed to do. And on defense, Zach, it was not they, – they made it hard for Lamar Jackson and this Ravens offense to move the ball. Now, you mentioned the Ravens were their own worst enemy in a bunch of situations, four fumbles on four straight drives, two recovered by the Colts, two recovered by the Ravens. But I thought the front seven for Indianapolis did a really good job. Lamar missed some throws. Obviously, there were some penalties that were not called late. But, again, for the Ravens, you can't chalk it up to, to these things. The Colts, I think, did their job in making it a game that was reasonable – I mean, the Colts are winning at halftime. They held the lead and the Ravens had to kind of claw and climb their way back into it on defense, though. The interesting point, and I know that the broadcast mentioned it multiple times, was that Gus Bradley began to blitz and blitz and send pressure at Lamar and Lamar started to throw balls behind receivers. Didn't do it the entire game, but the mm -hmm. pressure, it seemingly got to Lamar. What was kind of the shift change for Gus Bradley as this game went on? I don't know what it was because Gus Bradley's typically not been that type of defense coordinator. He He's the same guy he's always been where he's going to sit back in his cover three match and he's going to beg your, your offense to dink and dunk underneath. I'm going to come out, come up and hit you. And, you know, for the most part, it was working for a part of the game, but it started to break a little bit there late in the second half, you know, or late in the third quarter, I would say is when it really started to break. And I think Gus just said, you know what? I'm not going to let Lamar Jackson kill us with a thousand paper cuts like he has in the past. He has certainly done that to the Colts in the past, uh, that 2019 game, I believe it was 2019 game uh, or 2021 game. I think it's 2021 game. Sorry, where he was able to get the whole second half and, and claw the Ravens back into victory. Gus Bradley wasn't having any of that in this game. He said, you know what, if they're going to beat us, they're going to beat us by beating our blitz. They're going to throw it behind our blitz or, they're, or he's going to have to make some crazy Lamar Jackson play out of pressure uh, and beat us that way. And he did make some plays, but. At the end of the day, the Colts blitz able to get home. Uh, the Colts front seven played some outstanding football. They they came away with the sacks and the pressures when they needed it done. And uh, again, hat off to Gus Bradley. I mean, because this is Gus Bradley we're talking about. This is like a 19% blitz percentage guy. And in that, I mean, I would say in the fourth quarter over to overtime, they were probably blitzing at like a 40% rate, high 30% rate, uh, really coming after Lamar Jackson and, and just forcing him to make those quick decisions. Uh, and again, for a team where they're in their first season with a new offense and it's early in the season do it go after him go after him make him have to make those quick decisions and get the ball out of his hand because the worst thing you could do is have lamar jackson with the ball in his hands <laughs> that's the worst thing you can allow so gus bradley said you know what? let's go get him let's go get him we have fast linebackers we have good pass rushers let's go get him uh so yeah this Colts defensive performance was really hinging on the the calling of gus bradley and his adjustments late and this front seven just playing out of their mind and playing some really competitive football. Uh, the Colts defense carried the Colts to victory in this one. Uh, well, aside from Matt Gay, obviously, the Colts defense carried the Colts to victory. Uh, and they, they just played some outstanding football. And now looking ahead for the Colts, they have the Rams coming up here. They're a two-on-one football team, which is good for sole possession of first place. In the AFC South, all the rest of those teams, Texans, Jags, and Titans at one and two. Do you think the Colts could maybe steal the AFC South? I think anybody can in the AFC South because it's that kind of division. It's not that type of division where you're going to have a Chiefs team run away with it or anything like that. It's always going to be up for grabs because the winner is going to be at like nine wins to 10 wins. Uh, and the Colts are a feisty team. Again, they have a front seven that's playing just some outstanding football right now. They have a head coach who knows what he's doing. I mean, the last two weeks now, he has got the opposing coach on the other side of the field to burn a timeout when he was not going to do anything with that play. He, he's done it two weeks in a row now. That's a confident young coach. He's able to get a win out of his team with his backup quarterback on the road. Like, that is a really good young coach right there. Uh, the playmakers and offense are doing their thing. The Colts offensive line is playing some great football. So I can't rule them out because they're a feisty team. They're a feisty and aggressive team. And as long as Anthony Richardson comes back and he continues to progress like what we saw in those first two games, this could be a playoff team. I, I'm not trying to say they are a playoff team or they will be a playoff team. But they certainly can be. They have the ingredients, the feistiness, the the aggression, 
uh, the play calling, the head coach, and hopefully the quarterback when he comes back. So I can't rule it out, man. They they look much better than what I expected early this season, and they are just getting after teams. Major shout out to Zach for his Colts insight and for more on Zach's work. Check him out over at the Locked On Colts podcast, part of Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Coming up, we're going to be rounding out the show and diving into the Minnesota Vikings with Luke Braun, who's going to be talking about just what's going on in Minnesota right now. So be sure to stay tuned, plenty to talk about on the show. But first, this episode is brought to you by DoorDash. And if you're missing the syrup for your pancakes or just ran out of your favorite coffee creamer with DoorDash grocery delivery, you can get what you want right when you need it. And you've trusted DoorDash to deliver your restaurant favorites. And now you can get grocery delivery that actually delivers too. With thousands of grocery stores to choose from, you'll find the best in your neighborhood and boost your local economy with each and every order. So you get exactly what you ordered or they'll make it right over at DoorDash. So sit back, enjoy quality groceries just like you picked them yourself with easy substitutions right in the app and best in class customer service DoorDash delivers groceries exactly how you want it so you get 50 percent off your first DoorDash order up to $20 value when you use code locked on NFL at checkout limited time offer terms apply it's 50 percent off up to $20 no minimum total and zero delivery fees on your first order when you download the DoorDash app in the app store and enter code locked on NFL don't forget that's called locked on NFL for 50 percent off your first order with DoorDash we're back here rounding out Locked On NFL. Kevin Ostriker is still here with you talking week three action from Sunday. We'll talk with Luke Braun of Locked On Vikings now about what's going on in Minnesota. The NFC North champs from last year now 0-3. Luke's going to provide us with the insight we need to know now. Well, the Minnesota Vikings are 0-3, winless in their first three games after a loss in week three to the Los Angeles Chargers here with me to talk about that is Luke Braun, the host of Locked on Vikings. And Luke, these are the defending NFC North champs. I know there were a lot of different expectations for the Vikings based off of their offseason, but an 0-3 start I know was not optimal whatsoever for the Vikings. But let's start with the Chargers game. How how the Vikings end up letting this one slip away? <laughs> uh, I'm still reeling a little bit <laughs> from it. Turnovers again. I mean, they fumble in the red zone. The final uh, drive ended in an interception. It was kind of a tip drill deal, but, you know, I think the tip, I mean, you do practice the tip drill, so credit to the Chargers for that. I I think if I were going to try to go to something a little bit more uh, substantial, it would be that I think the Chargers put out the blueprint for beating Brian Flores' defense. They put up over 400 yards through the air. The Vikings did a better job against the run, but uh, Keenan Allen went over 200 in this game. Uh, with I think 16 catches, like it's just Scott or maybe 18, just nasty, nasty, nasty. And, and really what the Chargers did, and I don't know how repeatable this is for other teams, because I think it's part of it is just Justin Herbert being good, but he was able to, to find substan- substantive passes quickly, get the ball out fast, but not to a check down, to a, to a nine yard hitch or, you know, to a, a, a post route or something like that. Like something, they, they were really, really tight in their execution. And the Vikings on their side of the ball weren't as tight in their execution. Things were kind of a quarter second, a half a second later than they really needed to be to work out properly. And I I think it was, I know it sounds kind of cliche. I sound like Mike Zimmer, but the chargers made more plays than the Vikings. And like, I don't think this game, I I think the closeness of this game honestly is misleading in the sense that the chargers probably deserve to win by more. And I know that you talked about, you know, quarter second here, half second there. Do you think that these issues are quick fixes for the Vikings or do they need to figure some stuff out over the course of the next couple of weeks or couple of months? I I don't really know what the fix is. And that's a failure of my own, not implying that there isn't, I'm sure Kevin O'Connell has lots of ideas. Um, But it's, it's a comfort thing and a confidence thing. You know, you need to be able to drop back five step drop and hit the thing, you know, that you're going to hit. But it's like maybe a little hesitant and it's maybe got to wait for it to develop a little bit longer. And maybe the timing isn't quite right. And there is a level of comfort that just isn't there. But I I would reiterate that what the Chargers were able to do against a lot of these Brian Flores blitzes, which is get the ball out and not have that be a pass for three yards. Right. That's the point of what of blitzing all the time is that, yeah, they're going to start throwing quick and those quick throws are going to suck. They're going to be check downs for nothing. And if they don't suck, that's kind of the answer. But that's really hard to do, especially, I mean, you're talking about hitting a hitch 
on the field side with a corner bearing down. Like if you're not on that, that's pick six and the chargers were just on it all day and good for them. Um, so maybe the answer is hey, go up against Carolina next week and maybe they can't do that and this will work. Right. And, um, but I, I, on the offensive side, I, I think it's kind of just reps. And I mean, look, Justin Jefferson still went for a buck 49 cousins went for, I think about three fifty something like that. Like, it's not like the offense didn't work. They ran the ball well for the first time all season. So it's not like the offense didn't work, but you know, when we talk about a four, four point game, it's all these little marginal things that add up. And I'm curious to know, how, how would you kind of assess Kirk through three weeks? Do you think he's been good? Do you think he's been great? Maybe not so much so. I would I would say fine. Here's the thing, though, with this the contract situation that he's in, he's voiding on, I think, February 20 something. Um, that's like six weeks after the end of the regular season. And forget about it if they make the playoffs. Right. Um, which feels a little distant right now. But. Either way, I, to get a true contract done in six weeks from the Vikings are not they haven't started one. They don't have. Like they probably have some idea of what they would, you know, what, what they would want in that situation. They probably have some kind of idea, right? But they don't have any negotiation done. And that's a long process. So to get that process, that kind of rush job that it would need to be, the evidence to extend Cousins would have to be irrefutable. It would have to be, oh my God, you made it to the Super Bowl. You cannot get rid of Kirk Cousins after. It would have to be like that. So I think if you have a year where, yeah, Cousins throws for 4,500 and it's pretty good touchdown interception ratio, it feels like the offense worked okay, but they end up eight and nine and they miss the playoffs. You're not going to kind of put that rush job on it. Maybe you'll talk to him and say, hey, what do you want? You know, maybe, maybe we can make something work if you'll take a discount, but Kirk's never been the kind of guy to do that. And I certainly don't begrudge him that. Um, so I think the answer to that question is he's been fine, but fine isn't good enough for, for him to remain a Viking past this year. Right. And I think you have to see some level of growth within not only the offense, but the Vikings in their regular season, postseason, whatever it be success. And if, if you're getting these eight and nine seasons from Kirk, that's not the growth. I think the Vikings and fans and everybody want to see is to say, hey, we can keep this guy around and sign him to the you know, price of the quarterback contract is going up. So whatever that contract would be. But you mentioned that the playoffs seem a little distant right now. Luke. <laughs> yeah. all, all in three doesn't make, feel, all three. <laughs> doesn't make it feel great. But I mean, yeah. it's it's early in the season. The Bears also, they've been a dumpster fire so far. It's really nice to see the Bears in the afternoon window after you're like, you're reeling from a, from a crushing, heartbreaking final defeat. And then you look over and it's like 10 minutes into the game and they're down 21-0. Oh, that really takes the sting <laughs> out of it. You just, you love the visional rivalries. I know the Pack, Packers and Lions both two and one. But do you feel oh, like- yeah. Tuesday listeners know how I feel about the Bears. Yeah, exactly. But do you feel like there's enough time to get this shit back on track. It's only week three. I feel like there's time to get stuff along, but how realistic is that with what you've seen? I mean, yeah, I, I think ultimately you could make the argument for all three of the Vikings losses that if they do not fumble, if they hold on to the ball, which is like how else was the play Mrs. Lincoln, right? Like a little bit. But if you were to exclude those turnovers, you could make the argument that they win all of those games. They fumbled in the red zone and each of those games lo lost all of them by less than one possession, right? And that's going to be what the Vikings are telling themselves, no matter how sound that is or isn't. Um, and I think that's overly charitable, but that's what they're going to tell themselves. And O'Connell got in front of the media after that loss and said, no, I still believe in this team. I still believe in us. And I think we can still turn this around. There's 14 games to play, right? Um, it's one of those things where I think fans will, will quit on an 0-3 team. Betters will quit on an 0-3 team, right? But the team itself is going to play this out until they're eliminated. And that's always going to be the way that it goes. So I don't know, as a fan of the team, I have to decide now, am I going to be on that ride with them or am I going to start really focusing more on watching USC and UNC in college football? And maybe we start dreaming about a quarterback, um, but I can't do that. That's not, that's just never going to be in my blood and who I am. Um, so yeah, playoffs, not very likely. Nobody's going to say that they are likely, but you're not going to see the Vike. I mean, I guess we'll have to, this will test their fortitude, right? Under Kevin O'Connell last year, they never had to really ask this question about how much quit do you have in you, right? How, at what point do you stop believing in yourself? Because they won all the time. Now they have to ask that question. We'll see that that'll be a test of the culture. And culture was maybe the main reason that Kevin O'Connell was the selection of head coach. Luke's analysis is always on point. So if you want to check him out, go do it over at the Locked On Vikings podcast, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team 
every day. That's all I have for you here today, though, on Locked On NFL. I appreciate everybody for tuning in. Be sure to subscribe, follow along on audio form. Coming up tomorrow, more NFL content with your Tuesday host. So be sure to stay tuned for that. We'll see you right back here tomorrow on Locked On NFL.